Our keynote address for today focuses on innovation in the chemical industry, bringing science to the forefront. It showcases how DuPont applies science to deliver innovative, high-value growth opportunities in food, energy, and protection. It is our pleasure to welcome Dr. Thomas Connolly, Executive VP and Chief Innovation Officer at DuPont. Dr. Connolly also serves in advisory roles to the US government and the Republic of Singapore. Round of apl applause to Dr. Connolly. Uh, thank you, Nadine, and uh, welcome to Your Excellency's honored guests, ladies and gentlemen. This is my first participation at the GPCA forum, and uh, I thoroughly enjoyed yesterday. I thought the presentations were, were fantastic, and I'll do my best this morning to, to get us off to a good start and to maintain uh, that very high level of, of standard of presentation as I describe one company's effort uh, to use its innovation capacity to drive growth through high-valued products. Uh, as we begin, I would say that DuPont positions itself as a science company. Uh, we do this because of the, the depth and breadth of our science uh, capacity. Uh, when we take a look at, at our capabilities in the areas of chemistry, uh, material science, <clears throat> more recently, uh, electronic materials, uh, nanotechnologies, and a new capacity in the area of life sciences, including uh, plant science and microbial biotechnology. <clears throat> but it's not the, the science that we have, it's what we do with that science capacity. We can't leave the science in the laboratory. <clears throat> we need to move it from the laboratory into the marketplace, uh, where it does uh, good uh, making people's lives better, safer, and healthier, and, and doing for that uh, around the world. And this has really been the history of the company uh, throughout its 212 years. Uh, DuPont was founded by a French emigre who came to the United States at the beginning of the 19th century to found uh, a company to make explosives, uh, black powder, uh, initially translating, uh, transferring to, to dynamite, other high explosives by the end of the 19th century. And during the 20th century, DuPont became known uh, for its work in, in first in chemicals uh, and then in, in polymeric materials. So as the current century uh, debuted, uh, we felt the need to broaden our science base, uh, adding capability in the life sciences. Given the rapid rate of progress of the life sciences, there were opportunities that it represented. But I'd like to emphasize that it was about adding life science capability uh, to our historic strengths in chemistry and material science. It wasn't about substituting the life sciences for our strengths in chemistry and materials. And, and looking for opportunities really at the interfaces uh, of those science, and I will uh, describe uh, some of those examples uh, in my comments today. So as we take a look at the, the future of the chemical industry, uh, the future challenges that we need to address. The chemical industry uh, must uh, continue to evolve, uh, to integrate science uh, with uh, diverse ideas and, and collaboration across uh, many organizations. The chemical industry uh, must look forward. It must hang on to what's working for it. It must let go of things that aren't working. And, and certainly, it, it must consider uh, new opportunities in new areas. Now, this approach will be the same for the industry around the world. The specifics of, of how the process play out uh, will vary from region to region, but certainly the approach of uh, embracing change, embracing collaboration uh, will be true of the chemical industry uh, around the world. And I'd like to describe now how this is playing out in, in one company, uh, how the DuPont company is approaching uh, this challenge. So shown here are the, the three uh, strategic priorities, the three areas where D DuPont is active. And I, I think I'll start on the right side of this chart with advanced materials. This is the historic uh, DuPont. Uh, this is the DuPont of our advanced uh, material science that, that uh, gave rise to products such as uh, Teflon and Nylon and Mylar and Lycra and Kevlar and Tyvek and Viton and Calres and, and a whole group of, of new materials. These materials were new to the world, uh, new categories of materials, 
uh, where DuPont established uh, the initial position, uh, the industry leading position, and the, and the leading brands. And that is still uh, very much at the heart of the company and, and will be uh, for forever. It's still the largest part of the company. The newer parts of DuPont are, are shown toward the left. I'll mention agriculture and nutrition, and really through our own R&D activities supplemented by uh, M&A activities, we've built strong positions in crop protection chemicals, uh, in agricultural seeds and biotech traits, and also in food ingredients. And shown in the middle is the newest, and, and shall we say, the smallest part of DuPont, which is bio-based industrials. And I view this as a statement of DuPont's belief that the world of, of agriculture and biomass and the world of materials will be increasingly linked in the future. And while this work is still at its early stages, I would like to illustrate it uh, with one of my uh, examples later in the talk. So these are the DuPont strategic priorities. Where are the opportunities going to be for the future? And the opportunities drive largely from, from the growing population, and I would say growing prosperity within that growing population, which is leading to the need for increased food production, for example. The world needs more food. The world needs more nutritious food. It needs more protein. It wants more animal protein. The one thing that is increasing is the amount of arable land. And so the answer to the food challenge must come from greater productivity within agriculture. Energy demand is similarly increasing at at least uh, GDP rates. And we know that the solutions of both the energy challenge and the food challenge must not come at the expense of the planet. We must find sustainable ways to meet these needs. So uh, this is the origin of the needs. Uh, how do we respond to the challenge? <clears throat> and as I described, DuPont is a science company, so the solution that we come up with will, will derive from our science. Shown on the left side of this chart are the 32 core technologies within DuPont, uh, too small, I'm sure, to read uh, from your place, but it includes our capabilities in areas such as catalysis and polymers and organic and inorganic uh, chemistry. But it also in includes newfound strengths in, <clears throat> in plant science and in fermentation. And our solutions come by bringing together multiple science areas, one or two or six or even more of these science areas, uh, to create solutions that respond uh, to the needs uh, of the world in areas such as food and energy and protection. And I would add that the most productive times for DuPont's innovation experiences has been when we've been able to combine market insight and foresight. Where is the market today and where is the market headed with our technology insight and foresight? What technology do we have today? What technology do we believe we can develop for the future? And when we reach that intersection in the future, before the people we compete with, uh, we create a tremendous amount of, of, of value uh, for ourselves and our partners along the value chain. <clears throat> this chart uh, shows a, a bit of a cartoon of the innovation process. And there was a lot of uh, talk yesterday uh, about uh, innovation. So uh, let me offer my own uh, definition of what uh, innovation is. Innovation is the development and application of a new technology or uh, the combination or application of an existing technology in ways that create value. Value needs to be created in order for an innovation to have taken place. We can take existing technologies and combine them in a ways that haven't been thought of before. I, I've thought of this during Professor Chameau's comment yesterday about useless and, and usefulness of, of, of knowledge. And sometimes what appears to be useless information or knowledge becomes useful when another piece of the puzzle is discovered and put into place. And so the key step within innovation uh, is uh, the application of, of that knowledge. We can invent in the laboratory, but we innovate in a marketplace because that value needs to be created. I, um, uh, another definition of innovation I heard from uh, uh, Dr. Rob Van Leen, the, the chief innovation officer at DSM, who described research as the process of taking money and turning it into knowledge 
and innovation is the process of taking knowledge and turning it into money. So uh, that's really what the innovation cycle is all about. And shown in the central part of this chart is the historic innovation cycle. Uh, DuPont working with its customers, understanding the customer need, uh, generating a response uh, to that uh, need, and, and creating a product line that uh, was responsive. The new innovation cycle involves many more stakeholders. Uh, the term uh, inclusive innovation, or as uh, Professor Chesborough says, open innovation, is, is something that I think all of us have adopted at this point. It, it recognizes that uh, in addition to our own in-house technology, we reach out to partnerships with other companies, both large and, and small, uh, with universities, with research establishments, with startup companies, uh, anyone who has a solution or part of the solution to the problem must be approached. We don't have the time or the resources uh, to develop a solution in-house that has already been solved out of house. So this is really what uh, today's innovation uh, cycle looks like. I'd like to illustrate it now with, with a, a number of examples from the portfolio. The, the first one is the one that involves that bio-based material that I, t I talked about. It is the production of 1,3-propane diol uh, via a fermentation process. Now, that molecule on its own wasn't very useful, but when we polymerize it with terephthalic acid, uh, we develop a brand new material, uh, which we call Serona, which has a very unusual properties that have made it uh, a wonderful material for, for uh, spinning into fiber and molding into parts. We use fermentation to produce the 1,3-propane diol because it is more efficient than the traditional chemical process that it replaced. And we use terephthalic acid through chemical sources because, frankly, it's a very large volume material with very efficient uh, process for producing it. And as uh, Patrick Thomas said yesterday, the idea of, of a greener product is appealing, but nobody will pay more for a greener product, and certainly nobody will accept poor performance from a greener product. And, and so what we've done is brought together uh, the world of uh, bioprocessing with the world of conventional chemistry uh, to create uh, this uh, new material. Uh, we've uh, seen sustainability can play out in, in a number of areas. Uh, I've shown here some that have to do with uh, energy solutions, higher energy efficiency, which plays out in areas uh, such as biofuels or wind en energy, solar energy, battery technologies, or light weighting of vehicles. Now, I will say that some of these may be more relevant to the, to the Gulf than others, uh, but the idea of more sustainable energy and more varied uh, sources of energy is certainly a theme that is uh, appealing in all regions of the world. So let me uh, illustrate this with a, a few examples from our current uh, innovation portfolio. DuPont does not produce solar cells. We do not produce solar modules. We do not produce polycrystalline silicon or the glass uh, front sheet uh, for uh, a, a, a PV module. On the other hand, we create and, and produce many of the essential materials, and shown here are some of the major ones. I'll, I'll start with a Solomet paste, the front side silver-based conductor. It's that fine li uh, grid of lines on the front side of a solar wafer that harvests the electrons and allows electricity to flow. Our materials offer greater efficiency in converting that sunlight into electricity. Tedlar is the material used as the back sheet of the, the cell. It's there because of its long life. And DuPont ionomer and EVA resins are used as the encapsulant layer because they offer uh, long life and uh, strong performance uh, for the module. And finally, our engineering plastics are used in components such as, as the uh, inverters or even the frame or the junction boxes uh, for the solar module. So a range of materials uh, all uh, used and th which make possible the explosive growth that we've seen in uh, photovoltaic use. And one other point I'd like to make with this chart is that partners are involved. Value chain partners are involved in three of these four. Uh, I would say the Solomet paste is sold directly to the solar cell manufacturer, but uh, Tedlar, it, within Tedlar, we work with uh, both uh, casters of the film and laminators. 
uh, with the uh, ionomer uh, encapsulants, we work with extruders of the polymer film. And it, with uh, the rhinite components, we work with both extruders and with injection molders. So these applications are all made possible uh, through uh, downstream partnerships. Another example that draws on uh, the environmental benefit is our work on alternative refrigerants. The current generation of refrigerants have zero ozone depleting potential, but they do involve uh, global warming potential. And hence, the world needed uh, new refrigerants. This was being driven in the first instance by the European Union with its mobile air conditioner directive, the MAC directive, which said that high global warming uh, potential refrigerants needed to be replaced. And DuPont, working in partnership with Honeywell, has developed a new a generation of refrigerants, which are both drop-in replacements for the existing refrigerants that they're replacing, uh, and also uh, ones that uh, can be applied initially in mobile device, uh, air conditioning devices, but ultimately in stationary devices as well. These products are now just moving into the market and were developed uh, with Honeywell, but also in cooperation with the leading automotive OEMs. And my final examples uh, also derive from the automotive industry. Uh, shown here are, are two examples of DuPont engineering resins that are used to substitute for heavier metal components within an automobile. Our research shows that for every kilo of an engineering plastic which is added to a vehicle, two kilos of heavier metal parts uh, can be removed from that car. And this is a, a huge driver and a, a subject of great interest to automotive OEMs. Uh, in addition uh, to reducing weight, uh, we also reduce part count and we reduce uh, the cost associated with the function that these parts are, are uh, producing. So you can see here Hytrel uh, thermoplastic elastomer used in the suspension system of the car. And uh, one of the early examples of plastic thermoplastic composites being used to replace metal in this side, in this example, in a door brace of a car. I think what all of these examples have in common is starting with the need of the marketplace, understanding what the customer needs, and then using the science capability to develop a, a response to that. So in conclusion, uh, let me say that uh, the chemical industry does play uh, an important role and will continue to play that important role uh, through meeting the chemical and materials needs of, of virtually all sectors of the economy. But our continued success in responding to those needs will derive uh, from our ability to work together in a collaborative way, uh, to integrate new science into our existing science base, and to be open to new ideas and new approaches for solutions. So, uh, thank you very much, and I look forward to hearing from my fellow panelists.